how brazen was the Loomis Gang. The Loomis Gang was remarkably brazen. But they were very uh, dangerous, you know, certainly they were very dangerous. She didn't want to take them on. If you took them on, it wasn't going to be good for you. Fear, control. They destroyed a lot of people's lives. And they used the term, you'll burn. You'll burn tonight. And sure enough, that night their barn would burn. If you crossed them, they would get back at you. And they, they had very good memories. Well, the law obviously couldn't really protect anybody, you know, apparently. They just uh, could pretty much do what they want. They did not try and hide what they were doing. Uh, partly because they knew they were untouchable. You know, there's the term virtuoso, being uh, very accomplished at your, your occupation. Well, they were virtuosos of crime. Loomis Hill, as it is known today, was just another hill here in Oneida County when George Loomis rode his horse into central New York back in 1802. One can only speculate why George decided to settle here in the small town of Sangerfield, just south of the village of Waterville. It is believed that George saw the opportunities that the hill and the swamp below afforded him. I think he didn't, he didn't randomly buy that land. Uh, he clearly had been stealing in Vermont and I think fully intended to uh, continue. That was the way he was gonna live, the way he was gonna make money. He bought the land, about 15 acres at the time, in about 1804. And um, he bought it because of the, the swamp and the hill. You know, he could hide his stuff in the swamp and in the Loomis Hill he could go up top and see in all directions. I would guess that George Loomis looked at this both because it was relatively good land for farming, and they did use it for farming, uh, whether he was aware of the, how useful the Nine Mile Swamp would be, I don't know. It certainly looked like a good place to hide horses, which is what they used it for. George had left his well-to-do family in Connecticut at the age of 18. Came from Connecticut, then moved up to Vermont, had a sister in Vermont, and apparently was stealing in Vermont, and then got run out of Vermont and went to upstate New York then because he had also a sister living in Sangerfield at that time. Interesting enough, Domestic animals on the neighboring farms were disappearing. So the sheriff paid a call and invited him to a necktie party. He saw the writing on the wall and he left for central New York. He came to Sangerfield. He was a successful farmer. One day the sheriff came by and said, I need help. I'm going to have to arrest a man who's counterfeiting money and I need backup will you accompany me? So he did have a good reputation up until that time. And he went with the sheriff and the sheriff had knocked on the door and a woman, beautiful woman, answered the door and she said, what do you want? And the sheriff said, I'm here to arrest your father for counterfeiting. And she went back into the house and when she came out, she had a shovel in her hand and she beat the sheriff over the head. Rhoda was really upset that they would come in there and harass her father. So she grabbed a coal scuttle and she started swinging it at the, at the constable and, it, and then she took a couple swings at George and George said right there, that's the woman I want to marry. George Washington Loomis said, hey, if she'd do that for her father, think of what she'd do for her husband. George and Rhoda were married. The first house was situated here on the hill, which gave them the vantage point of the swamp and neighboring farms and homes throughout the valley below. A vantage point they knew would be necessary so they could be forewarned of approaching law enforcement that would be calling on them as their criminal activities increased. They had 12 children, 10 of which lived. The first one and the 12th one were both girls named Harriet. They both 
died at age two. There were 10 survivors, six of them male, four of them female. And some of the girls, they went off and married uh, one of the, um, Clarissa married a doctor in Sangerfield, others moved to Utica, married, uh, one moved to New York City, married. The oldest son, Bill, was not really a leader, uh, but worked closely with Grove and with Wash on it. But it was the second son, Wash, who was then named after his father. He was the real leader of that family. Uh, very bright, I suspect he's someone who, if he hadn't grown up in that family, would have done very well and probably, uh, probably accomplished a lot. Then under him was Grove, who was the horse expert and who apparently was inherited a lot of his interest in horses from his father. Very good eye for good horses and able to pick out the good horses to steal and then resell it. Wheeler kind of sat in the middle and he sometimes sided with the older brothers and sometimes sided with the mother and the younger brothers. The fact that he finally had to leave the country because he raped a mentally disabled young 14 year old tells you about all you need to know about him. Uh, and then comes Plum and Danilo, who were really much younger. I'm a descendant of Amos Plum, probably one of the worst ones, especially in the books. In 1825, the road, known as the Oxford Turnpike, was relocated to the bottom of the hill. Rhoda and George took this opportunity to build a larger house for their growing family one that Rhoda felt would be more proper for a family of their social standing. Then when they moved the road down to here, that's when Rhoda especially wanted to, to build a mansion that was uh, right for what they thought they were in society. But the house would also serve another purpose. They, I guess they started it in 1823, which is about when um, Wash was born in 1823 and then in 1825 is when Grove was born so that right about then is when they moved down the hill and um, it was a, a big house for the time uh, apparently it was about 50 feet by 50 feet three stories tall with a big kitchen off the back and a wood room off the back so that's a pretty big house for 1825 in this area from what the old timers who have been in the area forever, when the old foundation was here, kind of right in the middle of this little area right here, and of course this driveway wasn't here at the time. It was probably just like an old wagon path or cow path, but uh, Supposedly the, the main part of the building was right there. And at the other side of the driveway, you can see that little group of trees right there, the foundation of the barn. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a foundation right there. So this is like the complex of buildings is right in here. And in the house they had, you know, floorboards that could be lifted up and they hid their loot in there, walls that could be removed and, and hidden in there. Up in the attic was a popular place and it could be hidden. The house is described as having a lot of hidden compartments on it, false floors and things like that. Presumably that was all built at the time when they, when they put it in. Could have been added later on, but uh, uh, he, he was setting himself up for it to be a major businessman, as he considered himself. At the time they moved into the new house, the children were still young and impressionable. Rhoda took advantage of that by teaching them the way of the Loomises. They were taught from childhood to be criminals. You know, mother, uh, the mother of this group, Rhoda, um, taught them as youngsters, uh, you know, if you go out, don't you come back unless you've stolen something. I mean, they would steal anything. They'd steal your jackknife, uh, your walking cane. They'd steal the laundry off your clothesline. But they had stolen something, so they were, they were living up to their mother's expectation. And it started at an early, early age. 
I, I just can't, <laughs> it's, it's amazing to think what's, you know, what those genes, you know, with George and Rhoda, what they produced, amazing. The mother, Rhoda, had told the children, and this is a quote from books, if you go out, don't come back unless you've stolen something. But if you get caught, you have to answer to me. A good mother. She would even uh, reward her children when they come home from school. Oh, your grades are fine, but look what you got. This is great. You got this pocket knife and this watch. and Oh, yeah, so you got an A in, in English class. That's good, but this pocket watch is worth $5. <laughs> the kids were raised that way and encouraged to steal. And so whether they really were sociopaths, I don't know. It, uh, they, they, they were sociopathic in their behavior. If they'd been raised in a different family, I strongly suspect they wouldn't have been. But within this family, if you wanted to get ahead in this family, that's what you did. She's very unusual as a woman. For a woman to teach her children to be dishonest, to steal, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, especially from a woman who is relatively well off. And While Rhoda taught the kids the art of thieving, George schooled them on the importance of the swamp for their criminal activities. He taught his kids, you know, the swamp and how to get through the swamp and, you know, very few people knew anything about the swamp. It was just this forbidden area. There were stories about quicksand and, and you'd get lost in there and never be able to get out if you didn't know. Even to today, it's very rustic down there. I mean, you get yourself in trouble pretty quick down in there. It can be pretty eerie in there. Because I mean, other than the traffic that you can hear from the neighboring 12 and some of the other roads, but it's still a little distance off and you can hear that, but it's, you're very alone out there. The Nine Mile Swamp actually paid a large part in all of this because that's where they kept a lot of their animals and stolen goods. Well, the swamp was very important because horses were really their main livelihood for at least in the early years. Uh, they were making a lot of money by stealing horses and you can't put them all out in your pasture, they're too obvious. Put them down in the Nine Mile Swamp and you could hide a lot of horses down there. George and Rhoda would run the gang on a regional basis for years. It wasn't until the return of the second son, Wash, and after the death of the father, that the gang would swell to close to 200 members and become notorious for spreading fear throughout New York State and beyond. Wash Loomis had come back from California. He had been brought up on charges from stealing something, so he took off to California for the gold rush. And then his father, you know, was not well. He came back and, and caused quite a stir in town because most people thought he had been killed in a gunfight out in California. And that's when the one Loomis gang, or Loomis family, turned into a gang. Yeah, George uh, Sr. died in 1851 and Rhoda became the matriarch of the family, but I believe that Wash was really the brains of the operation. There was a big gathering, a big picnic party. A lot of discussion done. The meeting occurred after the father died, and also at the point where they were starting to become very large, where they were really becoming uh, covering a lot of territory, and the meeting, very much like the Mafia meetings a hundred years later, was to divide up the territory, to establish who was in charge where, what the procedures were, how you got your stolen goods, horses or otherwise, to the farm. About 70 people from all through there, 70 gang members, plus you know, wives and children. So it was quite a party up there. And that was the point that Wash basically started to get the organization going and expanded out. And he had this way about him that he, people liked him. People, he was, and people admired him because of his presence. And uh, so people just started following his, his lead. Wash emerges from the party as the undisputed leader of the gang some would say of the family as well. 
However, Rhoda had her hand in successfully running the gang for years and perhaps felt that her second son was overstepping his boundaries. Rhoda liked the fact that it was just a family organization. Right. They'd steal something, come back, they'd get to keep whatever money. Once Walsh started expanding the operation to outside the, the immediate area and up to about 200 people at its strongest. Walsh was more of a thinking, organized crime, big picture, where Rhoda was more for the, the present and now. Walsh is probably the only one in the family that could stand up to her, and he was determined that this is the way it's going to be done. And she said no, she had her own way, and it was working, so why would you do away with it? We have done things fine around here for years. The family, years. as time went on, became divided between the three older boys and then the mother and the two younger boys. And as time went on, the family became more and more split. But at its peak in the early 1850s, I'd say, before the family really became divided, uh, when the father died, it was really a, a outlaw gang run by Wash Loomis. Several strategies that Wash would implement would allow them to have a free reign of terror over the central New York area for years to come. Wash was a very intelligent um, individual, studied law with a, a lawyer in uh, Hamilton, I think it was Judge Eldridge, and never took the bar exam, but he knew enough law to keep the Loomises out of jail. So he knew how to work the law or you know, get to get people who may have been arrested off. If that didn't work, <laughs> then he knew how to persuade people, um, and or you know, basically threaten them. So Wash Loomis had paid for the judges to be in his pocket, and as the cases were brought before the court, the judge either gave him a sentence of two or three days, or a fine or nothing at all. And they served very little time. Keeping the neighbors happy, which they started doing in the 1850s after their uh, big uh, meeting in 1852, uh, that was very effective because by the time the sheriff and the other law enforcement officials got to their house, they were already warned that people were coming. So this again was kind of a smart, uh, protect your flanks, and uh, take care of your neighbors and they'll take care of you. The neighboring farms never seemed to have anything turn up missing. And there's uh, plenty of times where if these neighboring farmers would see someone or see Philkins or see a group of men heading towards the Loomis homestead and they would send their youngest son, run to the Loomis's, tell them there's somebody coming. And they'd take the back route and get to there first and they had almost all the surrounding farms, very good friends or members of the, the gang. At that time in Madison County, the 1850s, there was one sheriff who was elected and there were con one constable in each township. So you're, those, that's the law enforcement of the time. You have to remember there was no communication to speak of. So consequently, um, you know, lawlessness ran rampant, and the Loomises took advantage of every opportunity. They knew they could get away with it. They always thought they were above everyone else, high society, better educated, better clothed. So they thought they were superior to everyone else. They would either bribe judges or bribe lawyers or bribe the sheriff, or if that didn't work, then they would use intimidation. Apparently everybody, <laughs> most of the people were crooked, at, you know, the judges and lawyers and the sheriffs. However, there would be one formidable foe that refused to be bought off or threatened and became a thorn in the Loomis's side for many years. A blacksmith from the town of North Brookfield in Madison County would become constable. His name was James Filkins. Lived in North Brookfield and he was a blacksmith. He, he was apparently working in Hubbardsville, which is right across Nine Mile Swamp. It's only about three, four miles from the Loomis, Loomis homestead on it. 
Uh, he clearly knew the Loomises. I don't know uh, what um, influenced his animosity towards uh, the Loomis gang, but uh, it could have been some previous history, you know, of some sort. Um, but uh, he certainly was their nemesis. Well, the one adjective I think I would use uh, to describe him is pugnacious. Um, I don't think he was a very large man. I think he was a pugnacious little fella who wasn't going to take any of that nonsense from this gang over in Sangerfield. And I don't, he almost took it personally. He clearly had a hatred of the Loomises. It went back a long ways. He himself is described as not a particularly likable person. Uh, but for some reason, which hasn't come down through history, uh, he decided that the Loomises were bad people and he was going to oppose them. I think he was an individual who just really understood, you know, how dangerous these people were. Um, and I think he, you know, just had this sense of, of justice that he wanted to take an active part. The people knew that he didn't like the Loomises, so they asked him to run for constable and he won. Nobody else wanted the job. So they made him constable, and he immediately started going and trying to get the Loomises arrested for various things on it. Just as the new constable was elected, there was an uproar in the community over missing sheep. Many farmers were waking up in the morning to find a number of their herd missing. Wash Loomis hatched a plan that would eventually lead to the Loomis's first run-in with the new constable. Grove and Wash became part of this, this posse, in a way, to come out. And, and they led uh, the group out to Hamilton to the farm of Joshua, Jeremiah Clark, who is in possession of the sheep, no question about it. And when they challenge him, he claims that uh, he bought the sheep from the Loomis brothers. Uh, and this big argument starts and a serious fight breaks out. And as the Loomises were taking the sheep, a fight broke out. <laughs> Jeremiah was badly beaten, and his brother William ran to save his skin. Um, Clark now tries to bring charges against the Loomis for highway robbery. Um, and, uh, and, and, that started, and then they try to support, the Loomis tries to support charges against Clark for being in possession and the theft of the sheep. When the sheep farmer placed a claim finally against the Loomises, that was the first one that Philkins went and served. And, uh, Philkins was involved in, in serving the warrants on, on the uh, Loomis brothers on uh, Plum, Wash, and Grove. Plum jumped out of the window and ran. Plum escapes through a side window. Philkins sees him and gives chase. Philkins catches him before he reaches the swamp. These guys here, they grew up there, and like all boys and stuff, you know, you know your backyard like the back of your hand. So to chase them down in there was, it was futile. When they hit the swamp, I mean, there's a lot of documentation. They hit the swamp, law enforcement didn't even bother going after them at that point. They could get them before they got there, they got them. But if they got in there, we're not going in there. The Loomis house was close to the swamp. There was the, the house, road, barn, and a pasture, and the swamp was behind that. And... Uh, it was pretty much impassable other than the main channels that went through it. And uh, the, the Loomises would often, in order to get away from Philkins or whoever was chasing them, that's the first place they would head is right down to the swamp. But they knew the swamp like the back of their hand. They made it their business to know that swamp. And that, that was their, um, their, their way out, so to speak. Loomises, if they see him coming, they're running into the swamp. They're running every which way to, so that he can't serve them with papers to, to arrest them on it. And this goes on and on and on. But the swamp had more purpose than a quick escape route for the Loomises. The Nine Mile Swamp is actually noted for having housed most of their stolen stuff. It, you know, it was pretty well known that they were stealing, but you know, you have to prove it. You have to find the evidence and their, um, greatest uh, asset was being able to use that swamp, to know that swamp. There's, a, there's one place in there called Lost Meadow. So they would take them down there and like Lost Meadow. They would change the markings on the horses um, by taking potatoes. You could take a total black horse and now all of a sudden it's got a star on its forehead or you know a stocking or something along that lines. So they would take a hot baked potato, steaming hot, steam coming right out of it, and they would put that baked potato on the horse's forehead and it would bleach the horse hair. So all of a sudden that horse would have a blaze. 
and the owner of that horse, um, you know, they wouldn't let him get too close, but, you know, he would see and say, oh, no, my horse was all, all dark, that, that's not my horse, and off they would go with a, a stolen horse. They were clever, I mean, they used uh, stove black uh, to darken horses, they used uh, whitewash to lighten or give the fetlocks some whiteness so that the owners, anything to disguise the horse so the owners wouldn't recognize it. This is a story where they stole the horse from a guy, changed the markings, and sold it back to the guy. And, and the guy didn't even recognize the horse. I guess there's also a story where he stole a horse, and the owner of the horse knew exactly where to look, OK? So he came over and said, I think that's my horse. But in the meantime, he had changed the coloring and markings of the horse. And Grove's like, that's not your horse, you know, that's my horse. Apparently the, the guy had taught the horse tricks. So he'd call the horse, the horse came running, the horse would kneel down, it would roll over, it would do all these tricks, dance for him. And at that point, Grove realized that he wasn't gonna be able to get away with this. So he just opened up the gate and let him take the horse away. He's stealing a horse at that time in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, was like stealing a car. That was your transportation. It was something you invested a lot of money in. Uh, some of the horses would go for up to $1,000 if they were really good horses. Most of them probably for 100 to 200, somewhere in there. If the horses were missing, everybody knew where the horses were gone. There was one other location that was believed to be an underground barn, an underground stable that they did uh, a lot of their changing of the markings, and, but most of it was done in the swamp. They would hide horses and, I don't know, somehow they would have a haystack, but it had, a, you know, it was open in the middle and they put horses in there. They, they were ingenious. You know, there's a the term virtuoso, being uh, very accomplished at your, your occupation. Well, they were virtuosos of crime. They were geniuses. What are you gonna do? The pugnacious constable would experience the genius of the Loomises firsthand. After his first arrest of Plum, Filkins and his posse had taken him to a hotel in Brookfield to hold him. Plum reportedly escaped through a second floor window, landing on a waiting horse for his getaway. A few days later, the constable of the village of Oriskany Falls locates Plum, along with Grove, at Plum's girlfriend's house. Once again, Plum escapes. Getting charges to stick to the Loomises was near impossible due to the tactics that Wash would employ charge after charge. So he was, as you were at that time, he was trained as a lawyer. And again, that was very important to him. Uh, that also allowed him to figure out how to beat the law. Uh, because he knew something about the law, so he wasn't intimidated by the law. They were charging Philkins with abusing people and doing raids without any warrants. So they'd hoped to get him in jail, and if they could get him in jail, then they thought, you know, then we'll be able to kind of go about our business. So they were both trying to use the legal system to put the other way. If Philkins arrested Dino or Grove, Walsh would get the lawyer to put a warrant out for Philkins. You know, for some other, you know, roughing him up, crossing the county lines, illegal search. The Loomises could get charges dismissed for a whole range of reasons. You know, anywhere from it, it would take too long to where the judge believed the, the Loomises' word and dropped the case. And uh, that was one case when he uh, caught Walsh with a stolen horse, red-handed caught him with it. and went back to the judge six months later and said, well, what's going on with this case? Philkins did, and the judge said, so I, I dismissed it for lack of evidence, and uh, I believe Mr. Loomis. <laughs> Philkins was furious. And he would haul them away, and they'd go get to jail, and they might be in there for a couple of days, maybe a week, and then something happened. They lost the indictments, or somebody who was supposedly filing charges decided that they weren't going to file charges anymore, stuff like that. 
So they all had a way to, of working around it. So time and time and time again, they would be hauled off to jail and then they'd be back. Filkins embarks on a campaign that is designed to be an irritant and at the same time hit the Loomises where it would hurt the most, in the pocketbook. If he did 50 warrants and he only got, say, you know, for argument's sake, five of them that they were actually indicted on because, you know, every one of them did jail time at one time or another. The money that it costs for lawyers and getting them out for bonds. So I think part of his dealing with that was just to kind of hit him in the pocketbook and, you know, if your pockets aren't real deep or if the well starts to go dry, then you start doing other things and you can start making mistakes. They're a thorn in my side, so I'm gonna swing at these guys every chance I get, even if I know it's not gonna stand up. Well, if I yank you out of bed at one o'clock in the morning, throw you in handcuffs and drag you down to the courthouse, and you know, it's just, at the, at the, mo at the least, it's a mild inconvenience. This became kind of his full-time job, was just to try and get on top of the Loomis gang. I don't know if they did anything else, because it looked like a full-time job to me. But he was, he was very dedicated to this. This is a man who did not give up. And he took the fight to them. Uh, he did numerous raids uh, on the Loomis family, um, and uh, they were confrontational. Um, and uh, to be able to take the fight into someone else's territory, I mean, you had to be very confident um, and, and bold, and he certainly was. Wilkins was showing up every two or three days with a new search warrant. Um, and he wanted to keep them so busy trying to defend themselves in court that they wouldn't have time to do stealing. Filkin's constant visits to the farm were met with frustrations, as well as some humor. He was never quite sure what kind of a what, what, what kind of reception he was going to get. They might invite him in for a drink, or they might try and shoot him. And they did both. Mom? Good afternoon, Constable. There was a few times that Rhoda responded to Filkins when he came knocking on the door. I have a warrant for wash. And she would respond to him, is it your weekly visit? Are you coming for dinner? The last thing Rhoda wanted was for Filkins to stay for dinner. She also felt the same about the new breed of criminal element that wash was recruiting. Bill Albert, he was also regarded as one of the worst in terms of being dishonest on it. Uh, he was involved in some of the shooting incidents later on uh, of Filkins on it. Some of these people like Albert they became involved with, they would have been criminals in any society on it. And this always bothered, apparently, bothered Rhoda because she considered himself, herself very high class, but they were having to hang out and eat dinner with these, you know, with the scum. Uh, these were the people they could do business with, but certainly people like Rhoda Loomis considered herself above that. A lot of these people were not necessarily people that Rhoda Loomis approved of. They started hanging out around the, the farm. They started staying overnight. They started staying in the house. They were rough, and uh, Rhoda was more refined, and she didn't like all these extra people all over the place. She also took issue with the women her boys were bringing into her house. I think with her, she saw him as she saw it as turmoil, and you know, the queen's the queen, and nobody's close to her. And if she kept everybody away, she had no issues. But as some of them come in and stuff, she was just, you know, I don't. They're not going to take any part of my power. Rhoda had to run everything. She had to run her sons. If her sons became involved with any other woman, with any woman, that was very threatening to her. Uh, she wanted to control the whole thing and Wash and Grove, at least, were not willing to just be controlled by the mother. So Wash and Grove, with Bill as a supporter, gradually broke off from the mother. As Rhoda was having to deal with the unwanted changes to the gang and with the growing divide between her and the older boys, one thing her and the rest agreed upon, something had to be done about that constable from Hubbardsville. Rhoda was like, Let's, let's put an end to, you know, this, uh, any Falcons or anybody else that's uh, giving us problems because we need to go on making money. Make sure things got done her way. It was her way or the highway. She didn't care about what, who got hurt. Uh, she was a very 
self-centered, uh, manipulative, uh, but very effective woman. Of course you would. She's not somebody you end up, you'd want to run into. She was tough. A lot of people look at this and say, you know, Philkins had it out for him, but the Loomis's had it out for Philkins too. I mean. They tried in every which way they could to destroy him. They didn't treat him very kindly. I guess there was a mutual, um, it wasn't a mutual admiration society. They apparently hated each other. They tried, you know, confronting him, saying, you know, leave us alone, don't ever come on our land. And Wilkins just paid no attention to it. And uh, that's when they decided they had to get a little bit more violent with him, do away with him. Once again, the Loomises reverted to a tactic they had been using for years. They got a warrant for the arrest of Filkins from a judge in Higginsville, which is 25 miles from the Loomis homestead. Denio came to Filkins' blacksmith shop armed with an arrest warrant. Needless to say, Filkins knew that the Higginsville judge was one of the many bribed by the Loomises, and that it was the current village that Brother Bill lived in. At first, he argues that there is no reason to go so far to answer for the charges. The warrant was issued in Oneida County and served in Madison County. Filkins believes that a judge from Madison County should be the one to rule on the case. When Bill Wash and Plum arrive with some men of the constable's known posse members chained together in the back of a wagon, Filkins goes peacefully after Wash agrees to take him in front of a local judge in the town of Madison, but he refuses to give up his weapon. He also respected the law, uh, which I thought was really intriguing, and that is illustrated when um, the Loomis gang actually served a warrant on him from an Oneida County uh, judge, and he actually surrendered to them uh, under the authority of the warrant. He had figured out what was going on, and while he was being transported uh, to uh, Higginsville, which is 40 miles away, um, he came across another group of the Loomis gang who had his posse in custody under warrants also. And, but he figured out that they were going en route to the Loomis homestead and he didn't like that too well, so he broke free, actually pulled a weapon out on him and negotiated that he should be brought to a Madison County magistrate and be arraigned, um, and successfully was. Um, so that just, if you're going to surrender to your enemy under the authority of the law, you know, that says a lot about who he was. That evening, as Filkins is back home with his wife and children, the Loomises gain entry to his house, knock him down, and arrest him. And they executed the Oneida warrant anyway, they, and they raided his home, um, took him into custody, and I think they wanted to get him out there in custody. Then they could have done things, strategies to prolong the arraignment, prolong the, 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 the trials or wherever, um, just to kind of get him out of the way. The next day, he is taken in front of the Loomis' friendly judge and assigned to an unsympathetic lawyer. Just as the judge is about to hand down his sentence, a group of men from Filkin's hometown burst in the room with guns drawn and demand the release of their constable. They had heard about the incident and had ridden all night to arrive there in the nick of time. The judge set bail and it was paid immediately. Filkins was released. The threats and physical attacks have no effect on Filkins' spirit. He continues to harass the Loomises as they continue to terrorize the region. I think he was an individual who just really understood, you know, how dangerous these people were. But part of uh, what made them so dangerous is just the intimidation. Um, they understood how to do intimidation, you know, against others, and uh, the, the arsons were a good example of that. Um, they would burn barns and things like that. I mean, you burn somebody's barn down, I mean, your barn is really uh, your livelihood. You know, a person might claim that the Loomises stole two of their cows, they would file a complaint, the next night their barn would burn. He lost all his crops, and depending on whether he got his livestock out, he uh, could have lost everything. You know, if they got in a conversation or even in an argument with someone, and they used the term, you'll burn. I think a lot of people realize that if you messed with them, your whole life's work would be up in flame. Um, they used to say, you're gonna burn for this. That is how people made a living. That's frightening. They, they destroyed a lot of people's lives. The Loomis gang was remarkably brazen, even for the period of time they were. Uh, they did not try and hide what they were doing, uh, partly because they knew they were untouchable. I think they were quite proud of the fact that uh, 
they controlled much of the crime in central New York. Burning down courthouses and burglarizing, you know, the legal establishments and clerk houses and stuff like that, influencing by intimidation or graft uh, district attorneys and attorneys and judges, you know, and other law enforcement officials. The public was definitely, especially as it, as it got later and later on, the public was definitely against the Loomises. So, you know, there was quite a few of them, especially the local merchants and stuff like that, that were just sick of being terrorized. The main opposition that was beginning to grow took roots in a general store in the nearby village of Waterville. Well, the opposition to the Loomis gang really came from Waterville. Uh, and it really came from Bissell's general store. Uh, everything I found really pointed to that as the beginning of people who did not accept, were not paid off by the Loomises, did not accept them. And so if you have a few people who were unhappy with it, that then became kind of a nucleus. Bissell was outspoken. And therefore, a lot of people who gathered around the store, that's where they would then discuss, what can we do about the Loomises? What should happen? There was often conversation in there when people would gather in there about the Loomises and damn Loomises and the evil Loomises and they stole this and did you hear about that barn? Someone's got to do something. This was the beginning of the vigilantes. These were the people that wanted to see the Loomises end. Many people felt safe talking there, which in turn led to that being the epicenter of the movement against the, the Loomises. When you have a nucleus of people who oppose a gang like that, that is the beginning of when you're able to actually do something about it. Aim! 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 A year earlier, the disagreements between the North and the South had reached a breaking point, and the Civil War had begun. And they started to really get going during the Civil War. Once the Civil War broke out in 1861, uh, the Quartermaster General recorded after the war that the Union Army had required over 700,000 horses to execute the war effort. Um, they would go to Albany to get those horses. Now, the, the Loomises, knowing the Army needed horses, and, then, and, and they would pay very well. They'd pay $160 for a horse or 170 for a draft horse. The South actually were very good at stealing the horses from the North on it. Uh, some of the Southern generals were very, very good at this. The, the North was losing an awful lot of horses. So given the market for it, I suspect that they were making money hand over fist during the Civil War in a way even better than before the Civil War because the market was so, I mean, it was a real seller's market. The, the canal was very important. Bill, the eldest, had married a, a woman and lived up in Higginsville on it. I, I drove around that area. I could still find evidence of the side cut canal up there. You gotta remember at this time, the Erie Canal was a very big deal. This is the first time when you could really send not only livestock, but grain and things like that down to Albany, down to New York for that matter. So they would take a string of maybe, you know, 10, 15 horses, put them on that packet boat up at Bill's place on the canal, off to Albany and sell them to the army. They would make a lot of money for these horses for which they paid nothing. Here's the Loomises stealing all the horses in upstate New York, sending them on down to Albany, sometimes down to New York, selling them to the U.S. Army. So, so there's a ready-made market for these horses. And much of that was through Higginsville, through Bill's farm in Higginsville. Back in Madison County, the bribery and influences of the Loomises was about to help score a victory they had long been working towards for years. They actually helped defeat Falcons in the, in the village of North Brookfield. He was up for a, a re-election for constable. He had to run again as constable, and the Loomises had arranged enough votes against him, so he was not re-elected as constable. And he lost by three votes, and it was determined that the Loomises had something to do with rigging the voting. The, the Loomis gang controlled a lot of people, and by controlling a lot of people, they controlled a lot of votes. Uh, but the Loomises were quite capable of generating enough votes to get Philkins out of office. And they did. 
And that's when the people in Waterville said, well, if you move up here to Waterville, we'll make you constable here and support you to continue doing the same things. I think the people of Waterville and everything, especially the politicians and stuff, said, you know, there's an, enough's enough. This guy's a thorn in their side and he's been hammering them for years. What choice do we have? You know, lesser of two evils, I guess. We'll pick Philkins and bring him up here and see if he can finish this stuff off. Bissell, he came up with the idea of having Philkins move from North Brookfield to Waterville and he was up for, you know, they had an election and he won. Once he moved to Waterville and was reinstated, I think they were furious. Uh, this was not part of their plan at all. They thought they had gotten rid of him. And not only has he gone to Waterville, but he's then tied in with people in Waterville, some of the important citizens of Waterville, who probably are bankrolling some of what Philkins is doing. They're certainly supporting him. And this meant trouble for the Loomises, and I think they probably perceived that that was going to be trouble. And that was the first major trouble they had. Everyone else had been able to buy off. Philkins and the small number of people in Waterville could not be bought off. That was a problem. They thought that they had done what was necessary to get rid of him, and apparently he was still... That's when they really started to get violent towards him, I think. They had had enough of Philkins. And that's when Plum went and shot up the house with four or three other people. He was at home. They were in there. The, his wife and him were in one bed, and I believe he, was, he had three children, three or four children, were in the other bed in the bedroom. There was a pounding on the door, and someone said, Constable Philkins, we need you out here. And he got up, and his, he remarked to the effect of, you know, what do you need me this late at night? Plum had pretended to be somebody else, but Philkins heard the, um, his voice and recognized that it was Plum. And apparently all of a sudden, Jim! like shots started firing and there was like blue holes in the door, blue holes in the windows and the curtains, um, hit Philkins in the wrists his hands and, and arms quite severely on it uh, and through the window and it could have killed his wife and could have killed his what, four children that he had at that time but did not. Uh, but this was a very clear brazen attempt to kill Philkins. They counted like 30 shots in, in, in the interior of the house. This pushed it up to the next level which also at that point Philkins must have said one of us is going to be killed. Either I'm going to be killed or one of them is going to be killed. Uh, but this is not going to turn out well for one of us. The divide in the nation that had started a year before the attempt on Philkin's life still raged on in the form of the Civil War. North against the South, kin against kin. The dynamics of the Loomis family resembled what was happening in the country at the time. It's almost like there were two Loomis gangs toward the end. Wash started questioning his mother. All of the older children now were stopped listening to the mother and started, you know, doing their own thing, listening to Wash mostly. But there started to become this um, headbutting between Wash and, and Rhoda. Wash is probably the only one in the family that could stand up to her, and he was determined that this is the way it's going to be done. And she said, no, she had her own way and it was working, so why would you do away with it? Wash was away on business when there was an incident that would further cement the divide between mother and son. Wash had a girlfriend and she bore him a son. Rhoda was ugly mean. She did not want any other women in the house. Rhoda did not look kindly upon Hannah Wright, and um, one evening there was a, an accident. They had a hired man who was cleaning his gun in the back kitchen, and Rhoda is, re well, she's responsible for making sure that Wash's girlfriend is in the same room. And the gun went off and hit the 
lady in, I think, in the hip, and she bled and bled and bled. Accidentally, while cleaning the shotgun, it accidentally went off. And they could never prove that it was murder, but just that it was a, that accidentally went off. And that was another thing that drove even more of a wedge between the two. Obviously a lot of bad blood. I mean, what do you do if your mother kills your mistress? Uh, the mother of your child. Um, obviously this is a woman who is quite capable of killing anybody. Even with all the internal chaos, the gang continues without missing a step. The burning of the courthouse, uh, their most audacious act of arson occurred right here in Morrisville, uh, right on the spot where this building sits. Wash decided to go and pay a call to the Madison County Courthouse. Now that night, there was a fire and they burned the courthouse to the ground. On, I think it was October 11th, 1865, at 2.30 in the morning, uh, the courthouse was seen to be on, on fire and people were you know, calling up and down the streets, you know, fire, fire. Citizens with their buckets, their leather buckets would come and there, would be a, there was a fountain out front, 30 feet across, seven feet deep, and it was for fire protection. And the, and the folks, they would get their leather buckets or whatever buckets they had, and they formed a bucket brigade, and they were trying to put out this fire. The hand pumper, okay, they rang the bell, and all the people responded, all the men, because they had to put this fire out. And as they were pumping, Wash joined in. And the men started pumping the brakes on either side and pumping and pumping, and nothing came out because it seems that the hoses had been cut. So nothing was gonna come out of those hoses. And consequently, the building burned down. It burned to the ground. And who was in the crowd helping to put out the fire, helping put out the fire, but Wash Loomis. The sheriff talked to Wash Loomis. And he, he probably said to him, well, Wash, what are you doing here at, you know, three o'clock in the morning in Morrisville? And, and Wash probably said, well, you know, I'm here on business. And that was kind of one of those deals, you know, you kind of thumbing your nose at everybody. Yep, I'm here to help, but. And it's amazing, but it said that there were some indictments uh, pending against the Loomis boys. Um, and I guess, now it's never been proven, but we, we feel, and, and many of us do, that it was the Loomis gang that burned the courthouse, that cut the hoses, set the fire. And, those, and they felt that the indictments were here in the courthouse. You know, it kind of makes sense. However, they weren't. They were in the clerk's office, which was right next door, the county clerk's office. So, in effect, uh, the, the building was burned for nothing. Yeah, it's incredible, and even more so is that they, they dared to do this stuff because they thought they were invincible. The people of the area grow tired of the antics of the gang, and Filkins grows tired of the same old, same old. He was getting, he was very upset because he was, he was getting beat pretty much every turn that he went to. Yeah, he'd get them on a couple charges here and there, but between their lawyers and having different people in their pocket in the right places, they just, they were able to run roughshod over everybody. And I mean, if I put myself in Filkins and shoes, I'd probably, especially as a law enforcement officer, I'd probably stick in my crawl a little bit pretty hard too, you know. Come to a point where Filkins had gotten so frustrated with the law that the law was above them, that they couldn't do very much legally against the Loomises. His hatred after a while got to a point, especially after them trying to kill him and everything, to where he said, you wanna know what? They're trying to kill me, this ups the ball game, and this is what we're gonna do now. Then he started to become more, kind of almost like the way the Loomises were, fighting fire with fire. We've tried everything else. We cannot make the indictment stick. We can't get them in jail. The only solution is to kill the head of the gang. The head of the gang was really washed. One of the Loomises or Filkins or somebody, they were, they were gonna die. At three o'clock in the morning, pull Wash Loomis out of bed. Now this is around October 31st of 1865. And he, he, Filkins had decided, you know, he's gonna put a stop to this Loomis business. It was Halloween night. Filkins and three or four others go over in the middle of the night and call out Wash. Wash comes out back. 
and Philkins kills him. This is where Walsh was murdered, was right in, somewhere in this area. Basically, we had all went to bed. That so night, there were reportedly around 17 gang and family members of the house. The events of that night play out in the coroner's inquest that people in the house swore to a few days after Wash's death. Four people showed up at the house, Philkins being one of them, um, and basically, you know, got inside the house. They got to the staircase and uh, yelled, who's up there? And of course, some other men that had, that weren't part of the family, but were part of the gang, we like, oh, well, they identified themselves, and and he says, I want Wash Loomis. He went up and he kicked in one door where these other men were sleeping, but Wash was sleeping next door with his girlfriend. And he finally awoke, and he come, came, went to his bedroom door, opened it up, and here's Philkins. And Philkins says, I have a warrant for you. You're coming with me. And Wash well, at least give me a minute to get dressed. So he got dressed, and Philkins took Wash. Took him out to the woodshed, and then Philkins just beat him in the head with, uh, with a gun and left him there for dead. Philkins not only pistol whipped him, but they scalped him. Philkins' ivory handled revolver. Supposedly he beat him over the head with the revolver, and part of the handle broke off and they found it at the scene. And he had, he died two days later. Persuaded Grove Loomis to come downstairs and they basically beat him and, and uh, set him on fire. They took some jackets off from the coat racks, threw over him, put a sack of oats under his head and doused it with kerosene and lit the kerosene on fire. Looks like they clearly intended to kill both of them. They succeeded with one, but not the other. I mean, that's a pretty serious message. Um, and these are generally law-abiding citizens. They just had enough. Um, and uh, of course, Grove is, um, he's saved by his sister. The fire's put out. But after that, the gang kind of lost some of the control that Wash exercised over them. There's all kinds of other people in the house, too, who didn't come to his aid, which also then further, further made everyone unhappy with the, for the split the family on it. But there were several other males upstairs who never came down. Yeah, Wash was the leader. And without Wash there, uh, things went downhill fairly quickly on it. Before passing out, Grove manages to save his prize horse from the barn the posse set on fire. He recovers from the severe beating, but then seems to lose interest in the family business in Wash's absence. For Jim Filkins, it was business as usual. But even after Wash's death, he still pursued legal warrants against the remainders. Rhoda was not going to let something like the murder of her son get in the way of profits, so they really started going at it again. Once again, Filkins and his faithful were called upon to bring justice to the Loomis homestead, and once again, he comes close to paying the ultimate price. Bill Elford was one of the worst of the gang. They were going to arrest him. And they knew he was there. And so they then get into a gun battle on the stairs. But again, either they're not very good shots or, because nobody's killed. Uh, or their guns weren't very good. But they're, they're trying to kill him, clearly. Bill could be shot a couple of times. And then Elvard is injured and is alleged, at least in the story, to be dressed as a woman and driven away by, I think, Danio or Plum to get him out of town. Company, ready! The war that divided ready. the nation had ended. Ready. The local boys returned ready. from the battlefields with a whole ready. new perspective of the Three world. Long. The Civil War ended, Quickly, and all those veterans ready. came home from the war and saw that the Loomises were making money hand over fist, illegally, 
and they were off trying to save the Union. And uh, the, 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 the veterans did not look kindly upon this uh, activity. They had all been through war. They'd seen killing, seen deaths, you know, even seen deserters, I imagine, shot or hung. They became very rich during the Civil War when everybody else was off fighting, all the local men and boys were off fighting. The Loomises, who had six or seven uh, men of fighting age, weren't doing anything for the war effort except making money. And um, so that didn't really make a lot of people happy. They were sheltering deserters. And sheltering deserters was, especially if your sons were being killed, that was considered to be about the worst thing you could do. They had a, they had a lot of deserters that they would hide in their the rooms that were hidden inside their houses and stuff. And a lot of them, I believe, were just going from there up through and getting up into Canada where they couldn't have charges pressed against them and stuff. So that was kind of their safe haven. So it was a combination of the fact that the Lubis sons did not fight. They harbored deserters, which was just a terrible thing to do. And you had young men coming back to Waterville, Sangerfield, who had fought in the war, who said, wait a minute, we don't have to put up with this. There's things we can do. We know there's, there's other ways to deal with this problem. And uh, let's go and do it. The California solution to come from California, where you just take the law into your own hands and you hang the people or run them out of town or whatever you need to do. That's when the local Civil War veterans from from uh, Waterville, Madison, and Hamilton, probably some from Brookfield, all converged on the farm. And they were about ready to burn the whole place with the Loomises in the house. And uh, apparently somebody thought that wasn't really a good idea. They organized a posse of, I don't know, 150, 175 men, many of them veterans, went over to Sangerfield and they burned out the homestead. Interesting notes was Rhoda and the, her daughter and the ones that were the Loomis family that was there, they were running in the front door and bringing out casks of maple syrup and jugs of whiskey and pieces of furniture and pictures. And when they would go back in, this lynch mob would grab that stuff, take it around the side of the house and throw it back in the window. Amos Plum, my great grandfather, part of the gang, and the vigilantes came. And there was a tree in the front yard and they were determined to string them up. They wanted information, they didn't care how they got it, of who burnt the hotel, who was the ones that went after Filkins to kill, and a bunch of other things. And that's when they took Plum and they strung him up the tree on his tippy toes a couple different times to get him to talk. Um, they took Plum uh, and uh, hung him until he was unconscious, then they revived him and hung him a second time. He was hung three times and let down until he was perfectly senseless. Tongue would swell, his face would turn purple, they'd drop him, throw water on him, and, you know, tell us, tell us what you've done. Finally, he just couldn't take it anymore. And they lowered him down and he said, okay, don't, please don't hang me again. I guess after the third time was when he basically was telling everybody what had happened to local, who, who had broken into this place or who had stolen that. Then in the end, the house was fully engulfed in flames. There was nothing left outside but the one trunk of clothes. The barn was burning. And that was basically the end of the Loomis family. And they were told, you have three weeks to get out of town. Shortly after the burning of the Loomis homestead, Filkins goes on trial for the killing of Wash Loomis. Roscoe Conklin returns from Washington, D.C., where he was a member of the Senate to represent Filkins. He had it put off a couple of times because it was conflicting with his schedule in Washington. But he came back specifically to try and get Filkins freed. So for Filkins, I mean, the evidence was overwhelming against him. And what Conklin did was got Filkins released on a technicality that the original indictment was illegal and got members of the grand jury to say that if they'd known X, Y, or Z, they would not have voted to indict on it. So once you established that the indictment was illegal, then Filkins had to be released. 
So Philkins was not found not guilty. Philkins was never tried. Uh, the, the only thing that was tried really was the legitimacy of the indictment. And again, this is the kind of clever thing that Conkling was very good at. Everybody knew that Philkins did this. Uh, there was nobody who doubted that at all. But uh, if they could get him off on this technicality, and of course then it was never brought again, uh, basically they got him freed. As much as he was set by the law, when it was all said and done, he was just as barbaric as they were in the way that he ended it. You know, I think if he hadn't have been put up on murder charges, he may have been come across as a more, in the, in the area, more of a hero. Um, you know, he did what was, he thought was necessary, I guess, at the end. And I think if I remember correctly, his grave is on the side of the cemetery facing the Loomis property. Whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. But symbolically, it certainly is a nice kind of coda to the whole thing. That even today, Philkins is sitting there watching the Loomises.